Hello, fellow ag nerd. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Future of Agriculture podcast. My name is Tim Hammerich, and every week I get to sit down with the founders, farmers, innovators, and investors shaping the future of agriculture. Now, on this show before, we have talked about the hidden, unlocked potential of soil and how there's just so much we still don't know about soil, especially the biology and the billions of microbes that share ecosystems below soil's surface. Now, similarly, in and on each of our bodies are complex ecosystems of microbes that we still have a long way to go towards fully understanding. Many believe that that understanding and manipulating this microbiome can unlock new tools for health. And that same thing is not only applicable to humans, but to all animals, including livestock. My guest on today's show is Chris Belknap, the CEO of Resilient Biotics, which is an early stage animal health company that develops microbiome derived live therapeutics for livestock. In other words, they analyze microbes that naturally live inside of cattle, and then they administer those that are most beneficial to make the cattle more resilient to certain diseases. Specifically, they're focused on a biological solution to bovine respiratory disease which is currently quite reliant on antibiotics. Resilient Biotics is a portfolio company of Fulcrum Global Capital, which longtime listeners of the show will remember have partnered with me on several episodes in the past. Now, what stands out about Fulcrum to me, and you'll probably be able to pick this up if you've heard their episodes on this show, is that their LPs or their investors in their fund are from production agriculture. They really care about solving real problems in the food system, often for producers. And one of the perks for you and I of these Fulcrum episodes is we get to hear briefly from the investors themselves first about what attracted them to the company and to the space the company is in. Then we dive into the entrepreneur story after that. So joining me on today's episode is Fulcrum venture partner, John Perriam. He says part of what led them to Resilient Biotics is the fact that he and his venture partners, Dwayne Cantrell and Kevin Lockett, have been looking at potential companies who could help reduce reliance on antibiotics. One of the major themes that we've been taking a look at from the beginning of our existence is the removal of antibiotics from the food system. It's a global initiative to remove uh, unnecessary antibiotics from the food system. So we've been looking at a lot of different areas with that theme in mind. And the microbiome space is an area that we've spent a lot of time with. A big portion of the microbiome space in the animal health is is through direct feed. So we've had lots of conversations over the last, call it 18, 24 months with companies in that space and never got deep with anybody sort of interested in what they're doing. It's sort of difficult to pull a lot of data out. Some of those companies are very early. Some of them are beyond, frankly, where where we would invest from a stage perspective. But we were interested in it. And it was actually through one of those conversations with the direct fed company that they introduced us to Resilient. As you just heard John allude to, there are a growing number of companies in this microbiome space, but certainly one of the unique aspects to what Chris and the team are doing over at Resilient is focusing specifically on the respiratory track. They're not looking at it from the direct fed space, although their platform wouldn't prohibit that necessarily. They're going at it from the respiratory tract through the nasal cavity and then through the through the lungs. They're looking at developing a whole range of therapeutics focused on the microbiome that go in and address the respiratory diseases in the animal health and have potentially have um, applicability through human health as well. As we've all learned, the respiratory tract is a big deal in human health over the last 24 months. So we were immediately struck by the differentiation of how they were going about it. But ultimately, what really drew us to Resilient was this combination or, or the intersection between the biological and the, and the computational. What Resilient is doing is, is taking the, the biological, the microbiome, and adding the machine learning, the bioinformatics element to create this platform to identify the right consortia of microbes to have beneficial effects to identify them, and then be able to derive products um, off of them. 
This intersection of data and biology that John was just talking about is definitely a key and one we're going to get into here with Chris. I mean, the amount of data they're collecting about the microbiome of the bovine respiratory system is really pretty incredible. But before we get into all of that, I get ahead of myself here. Let's just dive into this conversation with Chris Belknap at Resilient. Chris co-founded the company in 2017 after leading micro product discovery for agricultural applications at DuPont Pioneer and Taxon Biosciences. He's got a PhD in microbiology from UC Berkeley. And we're going to start off our conversation here with Chris talking about what led him to wanting to find microbial solutions for livestock after spending the first part of his career more on the crop side. Definitely the experience with Taxon and then uh, following that with DuPont Pioneer, I saw the, the, the huge potential of microbial products in agriculture, both on the plant side and the agricultural side. I'm a microbiologist by training, so it's an area that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. And when I started working more with animals in those roles, it really became clear that the industry is, for example, very dependent on antibiotics, is also very impacted by diseases and by areas in which microbes, both good microbes and bad microbes, play a, a really big role. And so I took from that that there's got to be immense opportunity here in agriculture for um, microbiome-based products and innovative research in the microbiome space to basically generate new solutions for farmers. Awesome. And maybe talk about the challenge with antibiotics. They've been kind of the, the go-to solution for, you know, a lot of livestock for a long time. You know, what's happening there for those that may not be familiar with uh, with the limitations or the challenges associated with antibiotics? Antibiotics are an amazing, amazing innovation we've had that vastly improved both human health and animal health. And, and we certainly need to use antibiotics at times. These are small molecules that, that really help control pathogens. And, and certain animals and certain diseases really require the usage of antibiotics. But uh, with modern agriculture, what you know, we've effectively done is start to use antibiotics uh, more, more for promoting growth than for disease control. And that has basically led to conditions or instances where uh, antibiotics have the potential to be less effective due to the occurrence of antibiotic resistance now present on a lot of farms and you know, a lot of animals, whether they're cattle, poultry, swine. And so overall, the industry, meaning large companies in the space, animal health, animal nutrition companies, as well as the producers, they're very interested in finding new solutions that help reduce the need for antibiotics. And that's not to say that we shouldn't use antibiotics. As I, you know, as I just said, there are cases where we absolutely have to use antibiotics to help control disease and help save animals. However, if we can reduce the need to routinely use antibiotics and, and save them for when they're, they're most needed, then that would be a really good thing that everyone is extremely interested in. And that's where our company, Resilient Biotics, that's where we think that we could, we could play a big role here in developing solutions that are centered around the microbiome the microbiome are microorganisms, bacteria that are also impacted by antibiotics. And some of those are, are healthy organisms that can actually protect the animals from disease. And so our, our objective is to really identify the best microbiome strains out there that, that serve that protective role and see if those can replace some usages of antibiotics. Great. And how do you do that? Could you explain it in a way that, you know, someone non-scientific could understand, you know, the process of going about finding those microbial solutions that can reduce the dependence on antibiotics? It's definitely a, a complex problem. But to put it simply, you know, most people are familiar with probiotics. They're, they're healthy, safe microbial strains that we consume in our, our yogurt uh, or other fermented uh, foods. And it's generally believed that those have really positive health benefits on the host. And there's a lot of scientific evidence that is now supporting that observation that those organisms are beneficial to the host, whether it's a human or an animal. And so what we've done uh, is really start from the beginning of investigating these commensal microbial systems. And we do that using 
next generation technologies for sequencing and collecting a lot of DNA information about which organisms are present. And then we mine that data and do a lot of analyses, uh, statistical machine learning analyses to really parse through the complexity. There's a lot of organisms there. That's the one thing that that really makes this question hard to address and, and certainly still uh, a research challenge is that the microbiome is filled with unique strains and organisms that we first have to identify and then identify patterns of how those organisms can help promote health. And so we, we have computational methods to help identify those organisms that are beneficial to the host. And then we move into the lab where we isolate specific strains, test for function that we're interested in, and then we provide those strains that we've isolated back to the host like a probiotic. But what's different about what we're doing is that we're focused on respiratory diseases and the respiratory tract. And so instead of feeding these strains to the host, to the animal, with our first product that we've been developing for cattle, what we've been doing is actually providing it as an aerosol spray directly into the respiratory tract. So we're taking healthy strains from that system and then providing them back at a uh, at high concentration to help promote health. And that can be either through reducing pathogen colonization or interfacing with the host's immune system and effectively activating the host's immune system so it's it's better able to combat infectious pathogens. Interesting. And so the spray delivery, how is that different from how uh, these cattle producers are you know, delivering antibiotics? So what would be the difference in sort of the, the user experience, for lack of a better term? So the user experience is definitely really important uh, in, in production animal systems because, you know, time matters, labor matters in, in these systems. And that's something that we've really, really tried to understand and make sure that we, we layer that into our, our development strategy. And, and so traditionally or, or commonly, what, what would be done is that animals that are deemed high risk for certain diseases and particularly uh, respiratory in, in cattle, it would be bovine respiratory disease. What would happen is animals would enter a, a large operation and receive an injection, uh, a perinatal in, in injection of uh, antibiotics. What we're developing is more like a vaccine and vaccines can be injected. They can also be introduced as a nasal aerosol. So both of those delivery systems exist in animal health and we're using the nasal aerosol approach with our uh, microbiome product. And so for producers, this is slightly different than dosing everyone with antibiotics or all the animals with antibiotics, but they're familiar with the delivery approach because they, they've seen it used for certain vaccines in some instances. So that aspect of it is not entirely unfamiliar to producers. And now in my understanding is in the microbiome of an animal or a human or, you know, anybody there, there's, you know, millions, if not billions of different microbes in there. So, as you're going through this process of isolating whichever the beneficial microbes are, are the DNA for those microbes already sequenced or are you actually having to do that legwork yourselves? We've done much of it ourselves. Um, what is fascinating uh, about microbiome systems is that, as I said before, they're just so complex. And there's been traditionally a lot of work on, on gut microbiome systems. And there is in the public domain, from academic research, there, there is quite a bit out there on, on animal gut microbiomes as well as human gut microbiomes. But what is still very much a frontier are the microorganisms that exist in the, the respiratory tract, which is mainly what we have been interested in in pursuing solutions for respiratory diseases. And so what we've done uh, since the beginning is really go out and collect our own samples and sequence those ourselves and generate our own respiratory microbiome databases in order to understand that system. And, and the, the data that we've generated is, is quite unique and, and uh, really doesn't exist in the public domain because it's such a new area of research and, and really interesting area to, to work on right now. Just curious from a practical standpoint, how are you sampling uh, the microbiome of the respiratory system? We use techniques like, for example, a lot of people have had uh, COVID-19 tests where they've gotten the, the deep uh, nasal nasal swab done. So, so we effectively, we, we do that to animals. Uh, we collect deep nasal swabs. We also collect samples from uh, the throat area, the trachea, and the oral cavity. There's often quite a bit of crosstalk between the oral cavity and the, the respiratory tract. 
and so basically we, we use swabs and, and we, we work with veterinarians and feedlot uh, managers and employees in the case of beef to collect these samples that we've utilized to generate these, these databases. This unique database of respiratory microbes that you're building, how big is that? Just to give us a sense of like how much data comes from, you know, this process. It's immense. It's um, in literal terms, it's uh, Terra bases of of data. And an analogy that that my co-founder, chief technical officer, often relays to to people is that it would be like if there's a, a a library of novels, and each of those novels you trimmed out sentences for everyone. You trimmed out all the sentences and mixed them all up. So a library of books that were separated into individual sentences, mixed up and put into a pile. And now computationally, we, we go back and reconstruct all the books. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the complexity of the problem. And even just with one animal, that type of complexity exists. There, there's potentially thousands of microorganisms there, and we get little bits of, of information from each one that we then have to piece back together. So the size of, of the database is immense for the microbial portion. We also collect a lot of data on, on the animal, on the host. And uh, one piece of data that we collect is the genes that are turned on by the host throughout the course of disease progression. And, and so, you know, we have our, uh, an immense database of microbes. We also have an immense database of, of host information, both from the genes as well as the, the genotype, the DNA variation of, of the host. So it's an immense problem. It requires a lot of computational power. We have some great computers that uh, you know the company has, has purchased and, and utilizes. And we also have a lot of this uh, existing on, on the Amazon cloud. And I think that what's interesting about agriculture is that this sort of trend of data science integrating into various areas of agriculture, it's, it's happening everywhere. It's really important. And we see that the expertise that, you know, was previously in areas of social media or financial industries where there's a lot of data that, that, that algorithms have been developed to process. We're seeing those types of tools being integrated into ag tech now. And, and that's been ongoing for quite some time. It's certainly been, been ongoing on the plant side of it. And, and we're seeing it more and more in, on the animal side. It's totally a frontier. I mean, that's what's cool about it is, you know, we may have understood things from a higher level, but once you zoom in to to this granular level with the amount of data that you're talking about, it's like, we don't know what we don't know, because like you said, we've got to put the sentences back together into these books and even figure out kind of what we have here. You know, along the journey for you so far, what have been kind of the milestones or breakthroughs that have you really encouraged like, okay, this this is going to work? Uh, there have been many, actually, that, that you know, little ones and, and big ones that have been really promising all along the way. And I think initially we were really off on our own with sort of the idea of the company, which is microbiome, respiratory space, animal health. And no one else was, was doing that that I know of when we started the company in, in 2017. And one of the, the first meetings we had was with the head of uh, research at a, at a large company. We were fortunate enough to secure that, you know, that, that meeting, get face-to-face time. And, and it was sort of exploratory for me just to present this concept to him and, and, and have him say, that's interesting, that's not interesting, you got a long way to go, or you know, we, we'd like to work with you on that. So basically the conversation we had was, was very encouraging and, and you know, basically propelled us forward internally because we, we got direct feedback from an industry partner that they're thinking of the same, the same things that they're thinking about the microbiome. They need solutions for respiratory diseases. They need new solutions that are not antibiotic. So all of the pieces aligned there, you know, as we were starting the company, as we were sort of forming the idea of what we were going to work on, that was really important for me to know that we're on the right track. And then actually moving through our, our first product development steps. You know, we, we focused on, on this product for, for cattle, for bovine respiratory disease. No one has delivered a microbiome product directly to the respiratory tract before. No one has attempted to control these respiratory pathogens in the way that, that we're doing this. No one has built the databases that we've built to mine, mine the system and, and try to formulate a new product that could help help the animals. So we did all that. And then at the end, we had our formulation that we delivered to the animal. 
and we weren't sure what was going to happen, to, to be honest, because I don't think anyone's ever done that before. And what we saw was that it was safe for the animal. And that, that was the, you know, the first thing. The second thing is that it did actually help control disease outcomes. And we saw really positive results, the, the first study that we ran. And so we saw that we, we reduced the occurrence of the main pathogen. And we saw that the animals had less disease symptoms. And that was mind blowing for the company and, and for me personally, because it, it proved that this approach, this microbiome based approach to control respiratory pathogens is legitimate, will work, and we're on to something big. So that was a big milestone for us. And gradually, you know, a third example is gradually getting this story out to investors and having them line up behind the company. And, and we closed a, a, a series A round of funding last year in, in 2020, and, and that was a big milestone for us. And, and we have some great investors now that, that are supporting us that also believe in this, this mission of, of developing these new microbiome products for respiratory health. That's fantastic. Oh, for somebody maybe not from animal agriculture, or at least from beef, could you give us a sense of the market opportunity just in, in beef cattle respiratory diseases out there? Sure. Yeah. The um, bovine respiratory disease, the, the cost of the problem is extremely high and the market opportunity is, is incredibly high. And that's one of the reasons that we identified this as the lead problem that we should work on from the outset. And so you know, in terms of what it costs the cattle industry in North America, it's about three billion per year, and and that includes cost of treatments for antibiotics for vaccines. It includes cost of labor of managing sick animals. Uh, once an animal goes through a bout of respiratory disease, it generally doesn't perform as well. So there there's a cost to that as well. The 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 animal is going to be worth less at the end. And they usually take longer to get up to, to target weight as well. So all along the process, you know, with respiratory disease, there's cost at, at each step. And, and all of that adds up to about $3 billion per year. And in terms of market opportunity, the, the treatment market for bovine respiratory disease, it's one of the largest single treatment markets that exists in animal health. And in North America, it's getting close to about a billion per year in, in, in treatment opportunity. And that's largely uh, because of today, treatments with vaccines and, and antibiotics. Globally, that's much larger, potentially twice as large. It really represents a, a massive opportunity in, in animal health, which you know, on average or, or commonly animal health treatment markets for individual indications or diseases, they, they can be fairly small. A lot of those add up to you know, revenue as, as the big companies have found, but, but individual opportunities can be small. Respiratory disease in cattle, it's actually one of the, the biggest ones out there. And, and I don't know if you have ambitions to kind of go outside of just bovine respiratory, but I'm just curious, where would be the easier leap? Would it be to go to respiratory system in another species or to a different system within bovine? Uh, that's a great question. So we're, we're actually in the process of, of building out our, our portfolio now. And our conclusion is that it would be a really easy leap to, to cross species with uh, a respiratory microbiome solution. So our, our next step is developing a similar product for swine production right now. And, and we're actively working on that uh, as we speak. And the reason that we think that that, that approach is, is good in, in, in effect, following the, the respiratory health problem across species is because we've developed a, a lot of unique knowledge around the, the respiratory tract microbiome and the pathogens that can be present in the respiratory tract microbiome. And there's a lot, a lot of similarity, a lot of homology between species, between mammalian species and, and the respiratory tract microbiome. And so the solution that we're building for cattle, it actually is not that big of a step from a solution that we would develop for swine, or at least that's the prediction right now. And in fact, we are testing similar therapeutic strains that we've identified in cattle, we're testing those in, in swine applications right now. And that's really exciting for us because, you know, what we hope to do with this approach is that we can develop a large suite of products that, that really help reduce antibiotics and control diseases across species, you know, across cattle, swine, poultry, whatever it may be. And that, that could have a huge impact on antibiotic usage in, in North America and, and potentially globally. So, so that's what we're looking at right now. And 
you know, beyond, beyond those reasons, we're, we're also just really fascinated by the respiratory tract microbiome. You know, I said at the beginning, it's, it's still very much a frontier. We've developed a unique knowledge base around that unique databases that no one else has. And for us, it's kind of a no brainer that we should capitalize on that as much as possible and try to find solutions for other species. And as you're going about that process, my understanding is the microbiome is like its own little ecosystem in there. How do you make sure that the introduction of more of these beneficial microbes doesn't have some sort of side effect or unintended consequence to the ecosystem that might not be positive? Yeah, that's that's certainly something that we look for and, and we measure. You know, as we run our studies, we sample the animals ahead of any treatment. We sample them during the treatment and we sample them after the treatment. And basically what we're looking for are, are large changes to the microbiome that could be harmful. And thus far, we, we haven't seen that. And, you know, we, we think the reason is because that we're, we're utilizing strains that we've identified as being associated with health, promoting health, and we're putting them back into the system from which they originated from effectively. And, and so it's not like it's a, a new chemical, a new pharmaceutical product that the animal's never seen. These are organisms that probably exist there at some low level to begin with, and we're, we're providing them back at a, at a different concentration at, at a key time point when it, they could have a large impact on the health outcome of the animal. So thus far, we have not seen any negative consequences to the ecosystem, to the animal, or, or really any any you know negative outcomes at, at all. What was that like when you first started kind of reaching out to producers for the first time? Was the the question sort of like, hey, can I come out and, you know, and sample the microbes that are in your cattle respiratory system? You know, how, how did that get going of actually working with producers initially? Yeah, well, that's that's exactly right. So we you know, called up, um, you know, people I knew in in the animal industry, some veterinarians or consultants in the industry, and said, "I, you know, I'd, we'd like to come come collect samples." And um, there there were some some questions at the beginning, like, "Why are you doing this?" You know, some head scratching microbiome with that, you know, that's that those sorts of questions, but. You know, explaining that we're working on a solution for bovine respiratory disease in, in the case of our cattle product. I mean, that that resonated with everyone because everyone recognizes that as a problem. And so we've always had really good feedback from, from people in the industry that, you know, they have said, if you can find a non-antibiotic solution for bovine respiratory disease, we would line up to, to buy that. And of course, it has to be efficacious, but people would really respond to that. And so early on, you know, just getting through those initial like awkward, um, why are you doing this? You know, getting through those questions and explaining that, you know, we think the samples that we can collect from the respiratory tract could be really important in developing new solutions for bovine respiratory disease. Generally, people responded positively to that. And what's the path to commercialization look like uh, from here? You know, what's next? Is is there a lot of, you know, regulatory red tape for a micro product or because it's naturally occurring, do you get to kind of, you know, bypass some of that? There's always a, a regulatory step and, and that's, you know, something that large companies and small companies like us, you know, have to, to contend with and we, we have to work with regulators to, to get the product to market. We are uh, in the early stages of looking at our, our regulatory options for the bovine respiratory disease product, uh, but we've gotten great feedback from people who are knowledgeable in that space, and, and we see you know, a, a path to market working with the appropriate regulatory body on that. What we foresee in the future is that there could be changes to how these, these products are, are reviewed from a, a regulatory standpoint, or at least you know, that maybe that's my, my positive spin on, on what we foresee in the future. I think that, uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of progress in how microbial products or microbiome-based products are viewed by both the general public as well as regulatory bodies. And, you know, to their credit on the human health side, they've really been driving this forward with, with the human, uh, human health FDA and really defining how microbiome products are reviewed and what regulatory steps are required Animal health regulators are also having those conversations and trying to identify the, the best path forward of, of how to regulate these products. You know, in our case, they do come from the animals originally. They're natural products. Uh, they're not 
chemicals that could end up in the food chain and you know in, in in the final product that goes into the supermarket. So so all of those factors are being taken into account as we we think about how to review microbiome products. There's a framework that's in place right now, but I suspect that over the next few years there there's going to be changes to how these types of products are are examined by the regulatory bodies in animal health. When do you expect customers to be able to buy the product? And will it be kind of an over-the-counter type product where they have to go through a veterinarian? How does that part work? With our our product right now, we anticipate it to be regulated more like a, a vaccine, in which case it would have to go you know through a veterinarian to utilize it. In our pipeline, we're looking at development of you know, other types of products or different forms of a product that that may have a more of a, a feed additive type of, of regulatory oversight. And those could be different. But but for right now, our, our lead product uh, would be overseen by a, a veterinarian. And in terms of path to market, so you know, average timing of getting through the regulatory and, and, and getting to commercialization from the point we are now is about three years. So that's that's when we expect something like this to be on the market. There are potentially opportunities to have earlier approval. Most commonly, that's used for emergency scenarios where there's maybe a, a new disease, a new virus, and, and you know a, a vaccine can be manufactured relatively quickly. So, so those types of pathways do exist, and uh, we're also looking at that for for our product. You know, we think that if we can replace antibiotics, that you know it could be viewed as as something as as fairly urgent to help reduce resistance on on farms. We won't be able to make that decision ourselves. We'll have to work with the regulators, but but there could be options to help shorten that timeline and and get it to market. I know with crops among producers, there's a bit of a stigma with microbial products. Like, oh yeah, everybody's trying to show up with that you know new microbe that's supposed to boost my yield and it never works type of thing. And you know. I'm, it's not exactly, but but anyway, there's a little bit of a stigma with microbial products. Is it that way on livestock or is, you know, livestock, it seems to not have had so many of these products show up over the years that maybe it's, you know, it doesn't carry quite that stigma. It, maybe it's not it's quite as bad as that. However, there are products that are not regulated that can be commercialized. And there are a number of those on the market that feedlot managers have to sort of wade through and decide if they're going to test those and then evaluate if they actually work. We are not developing that. We've set out from the, the very beginning of developing new solutions that have proven efficacy first in the lab and then second in the field. And we have that data to show to the veterinarian or, or feedlot manager. And ultimately, you know what, what we what we want to have is a product that removes that that sort of stigma of it being the black box fairy dust solution. We want to have concrete data, the same data that you would have for a new vaccine or a new antibiotic or a new you know pharmaceutical product. It's the same type of approach and the same type of regulatory oversight. And ultimately, our goal is to to you know have an efficacious product where there's no doubt that it does what it's supposed to do. And, and producers don't, don't have to think about it. You know, is this, this really work or is this fairy dust? We don't want to have them even go into that, that sort of, you know, realm of, of thinking. We want them to know that, that it works. So that's the development path that, that we're pursuing. It is harder, it's longer, but we feel it's the best opportunity to, to develop microbiome products. Excellent. And do you imagine a future in which these microbial products are actually, you know, gene edited in some way using using that type of technology where we can, you know, optimize the microbe for exactly what we want it to do? Or is it a whole lot more, you know, complicated than that? Is that something you see as feasible? Technically, yes, absolutely. It's feasible today, uh, as a matter of fact. I, there's There's absolutely nothing stopping us or you know other other companies in the space from genetically engineering strains microbes for for benefit I, I think what what is the bigger question is where that product fits in for consumers and producers and if there's potential risk in how the meat is is perceived in in the supermarket and that's probably the bigger question similar to genetically modified organisms, that are the animals that we eat. So genetically modified fish, genetically modified pigs, you know, something like that, which, you know, the technology exists, but 
you know, we've sort of collectively decided as a society that you know maybe we're not ready for that exactly right now. Although I think the industry is, and, and society is warming up to it, but you know, we, we can do that today. I think in the human health space, there are great examples of microorganisms being modified to, for example, deliver a specific drug within the host. And so there's, there's been drug pathways that have been engineered into strains that are otherwise healthy and harmless. And then those strains are delivered into the host. And then within the host, they make the drug. And, and doing something like that, I think it's, it's certainly the, the future of the microbiome field. It's more about community, societal perception, and, and also establishing the regulatory framework for those types of things. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Chris, I, I really appreciate this. This is fascinating. This is totally different than anything I think we've covered in 260 episodes. So very, very cool. I, I'm glad to to share this with the audience. Anything else, though, that you were either hoping to mention while we had you on here or something that we maybe touched on but didn't go deep enough into? We're, we're really excited to to just keep pushing hard for developing these types of products and other systems. I mean, we, we see this as, you know, potentially... Um, you know, a word that's thrown around a lot now is, is One Health. And, and we think about having solutions that benefit animals that and equally benefit humans and the food supply and the climate and all of it. And we very much see what we're doing as that, or at least we aspire for it to be that, where the, these microbiome products, they're, you know, in a, for one disease indication in, in, in cattle, yes, but what we're actually doing is developing a replacement for antibiotics that can decrease uh, inefficiencies on the farm that helps bring more animals to market. So there's more food in the food supply chain. There's less resources required for growth and therefore there, it's better sustainability and ultimately improving outcomes like, you know, that, that, that are important for the climate as well. So I think it, it may be a bit grandiose, but, you know, these small products that we're developing now, we see them as having this huge impact on on society overall in this one health movement. And, and that's that's where we'd like to be as a company. And that's where we see ourselves as a company. Very cool. Thank you so much to Chris Belknap of Resilient Biotics for being on the show. Make sure you go learn more about them over at their website, resilientbiotics.com. I mentioned this episode to my wife, who's a veterinarian, and she was really excited about the potential possibilities here. She used to work out in Western Kansas and worked on cattle. And so she knows what a big challenge this is. And hey, I also need to mention that Resilient Biotics was the grand prize winner of the Beef Alliance Startup Challenge that we talked about on this podcast back in episode 236. So congratulations, not only to Resilient for winning, of course, but also to the Beef Alliance for a successful challenge and having such a great competition. So I hope that is an annual event. Uh, Go back and listen to 236 if you haven't. If you enjoyed this episode, you'll really get a kick out of that because this has kind of come full circle. Thanks as well to Fulcrum Global Capital for partnering with me on this episode. You can learn more about them at their website, fgcvc.com. That's short for Fulcrum Global Capital VC. So fgcvc.com. Really appreciate that partnership because episodes like this are frankly a little bit out of my depth and I probably would have never been able to bring you a concept a company, an episode like this one without that partnership. So thank you so much to Fulcrum. Really appreciate you. Hey, thanks as always for your time and your attention. I never take it for granted. I'll be back next week with another story of ag innovation. 